Now, for us, I can hear a priest who go around from one parish to another in the country. It's sometimes difficult to adjust ourselves to the church calendar. Because we either arrive long before a big festival, or we arrive afterwards. So today, I want to take an average date and uh, adjust my sermon accordingly. Now, the month of May, as you know, was the month of our isolation. That month is dedicated to her. And the last day in May, the 31st of May, is the feast of Our Lady Queen, Maria Regina. Now, coming, we're today the 15th of June. So, in about two weeks' time, we shall be celebrating the feast of the visitation of Our Lady. So it seems to me that since today comes just about halfway between two Marian feasts, that I should preach to you this afternoon on the subject of our blessed Lady. Now, the 2nd of July, as I said, is the feast of the visitation of our blessed Lady. And the visitation is one of the mysteries, one of the joyful mysteries of the Most Holy Rift. Now the visitation commemorates that event in the life of the Holy Mother of God when she was carrying in her womb the Holy Son of God and she went to visit her cousin, St. Elizabeth. And St. Elizabeth at that time was carrying in her womb St. John the Baptist. And so the two women, the two kinsmen, so they were related to each other, they met and visited the each other. And it was on that occasion that the Holy Spirit left at the womb of our lady, and that our blessed lady spoke the words of the mighty So it's a very beautiful event. The visitation of our blessed lady. Now I want to take that word visitation and give it a broader application. Our lady, right down the centuries, has been visiting this world, on certain great occasions, to communicate to the world certain things of great importance. Now, she started doing this right at the very beginning. In fact, the first appearance of our blessed lady happened in the same. The very years after the resurrection, not the day day. And our lady was still alive. This was before the assumption. She was alive at the house. And so today, one of the apostles of our blessed Lord had gone to Spain, which at that time was the Roman province of Hispania. He'd gone there to try to convert the people there to the Christian faith, to the Holy Catholic Church. So he arrived in a town in the north of Spain on the banks of the river Avon. And that was a Roman garrison town. And that town was named after the emperor who had been emperor when Christ was born, Caesar Augustus. The name of the town was Caesar Augustus. The name that had been corrupted was by God of Sarkos. So, St. So James, day after day, preached in the marketplace of that town about the resurrection of our blessed Lord <coughs> and sought to convert the people to the church. But the people said, they're not there. They wouldn't listen. The young boys were too dumb that. So we had a very miserable time. And after he came there for three weeks, he began to study. And one evening, he sat down on the banks of the river Avery, near the ruins of an old Roman pagan camp. And there was a broken pillar standing there by him. And he propped himself against that pillar. And he thought to himself, there's no use saying this, President. 
She said, I brought you to the table with me. And she said, I want you to build on this cross of Christ. And dedicate it to me. To Christ Christ. And she said, as long as this town stands here, my son will be worshipped in this place. Then she disappeared. Well, conjecture said, the following morning he went into the marketplace, and nobody lost. They stood at the table. And at the end of his address, people came up and knocked the back. So he stayed, and he had a very fruitful ministry there in Chicago. And he erected there, with the help of the people of that town, a chapel. And today, on that spot, there's still a very glorious facility, a beautiful facility. It's a riot of those two towers, so beautiful. It's decorated inside with the most beautiful fresco. Fresco is like oil, celebrating static change and others. And it's called the Basilica of Our Lady of the Pillar, the Western St. George del Vila. It's a wonderful shrine of our Blessed Lady. And it records her first appearance after the resurrection of our Lady. I've got a city for a drink. I've taken class on two occasions in that city. And uh, in that church, the pillar, on which I heard this girl is still with us. <coughs> and for 19th century now, the pillar of the belt down and this that pillar. And the result is that the pillar is more than rock things for people that are interested in the 19th century. And for some reason, that church, there's always a long line of people waiting for you to come down to this that. And during the months that I spent in Florida, I spent six months there on two different occasions. I went there almost every day except on one or two occasions when I had to live there. And I always went no down in this place. Right for our last place. It's a wonderful place. And it records our first prayer. Now, I'm going to come up for the summer day. The, a few years later, the Spanish began to come about in Mexico, but it's not Mexico. And the center of their urbanization down there was what is now Mexico City. And uh, Mexico City, as you know, about 7,000 people of Sila. So it's a pretty good one for And one day, a poor Indian, a very, very poor Indian, was walking up a hill outside of what is now Mexico City. He was very cold, and he had his set up his Ruman, a sort of coat around him. And he fell in that because it was so cold. The wind was blowing very hard. And he was trudging up the hill in a very dry, he worked all day. And suddenly, as he was walking along, he began to come into a great wall. He began to do a wall. And then around he saw a wall. And he looked up, and there she was. The Holy Ending Act that was under his body. That was her first appearance on American soil. Look outside and put it down the street. Now, that's the lady spoke to this poor Indian. And she told him who she was. And she told him to build a chapel there. Or to have built there a chapel in her own. And uh, she spoke to him. She had roses in her arm. And when he took off his stone thing, her image was imprinted on the Sarah. And that's the business. And that is the great shrine of our Lady of Guadalupe, the Western City of Lady Guadalupe. That was her first appearance on American soil. And she came to assure the, new, the people of the New World that her son was King of the Americas. And so Our Lady of Guadalupe is the patroness of all the Americas, including the United States. She's our glorious patron. Our mission has a chapel in Miami, in Florida. And over half of the congregation there are Cubans, refugees from communist Cuba. And that chapel is dedicated to our Lady of Guadalupe. And during the last three or four years, I've spent quite a lot of time working on our mission in Florida. And I always love going to that chapel in Egypt today. That was her first appearance on American soil. And America belong to her. She is our queen. In the south of Vermont, in the middle of the last century, there was a little village which still stands there. It's also a little town. 
And remember, this was in the middle of the last century, the 19th century. And that 19th century was in many ways a horrible century. It was a century when science was advancing very rapidly. It was a science, it was a century in which all sorts of technical advances came to the world, especially to the Western world. Railways, steamships, all sorts of new things appeared, the cotton gin, things like that. It was the century of the Industrial Revolution. People were making money hand over fist, but on the other hand, poverty was increasing. It was a century in which people were forsaking God, because many were preaching a gospel of crass materialism. The Freemasonic Lodge, which is always the enemy of the Catholic Church in every age, and in every country where it exists, the Freemasonic Lodge was fighting the Church on every hand. In many Christian countries, there was a Freemasonic government. The government in France was composed largely of atheistic Freemasons, and in other countries as well. So it was a horrible time. People were forsaking the Church in thousands, and tens of thousands, and millions, and lapsing into complete materialism or atheism. So in this village, the south of France, near the Spanish frontier, there lived a family, a very, very desperately poor family. There was a father and a mother, and there were several children, and they were very big. They lived in a hall, not in for hands. They had very little to eat. The father was usually unemployed. He was willing to do any sort of job to get a few pennies to feed his family. But usually he had no job at all. The family, many, many nights, went to bed without anything to eat. They were hungry. They had no clothes to speak of except rags. They only had one or two pairs of shoes for the whole family. Most of them were there with. They had one daughter who suffered from an asthmatic condition. She was a very delicate, frail child. Sometimes she got in a, a coughing spell to seize her. And this coughing spell was she coughed so violently that her mother and father thought she was going to die. Her next was, you know, they had a and one day, later, on the 11th day of February, the mother asked Carolyn to go out with two of her cousins to gather plants in them for the house. And this child, the man she had been with Lord, and running through that town is a swift river, very swift flowing, called the Gaal. G-A-D-E. And along on the banks of that gal, just outside of the then limits of the village, was a large hay or grotto. And that area was used as a garbage dump. The village folks could do their garbage. So there was a lot of kindling around there, a lot of wood, fire. So Bernadette and her two companions, the other two girls, went down there to this grotto. And the river had caused puddles all around there, <coughs> puddles of water. And this water was icy cold. So when they got there, the two other, other two girls began playing a hop, skip, and jump game. They jumped across these puddles. And uh, occasionally, one of them would miss, and they'd land in the puddle. Get their feet very wet and very cold. But Bernadette was afraid to play with <laughs> because she knew that if she got into that icy cold water with her bare feet, it might bring on a terrible coughing spell. And she was afraid of the coughing spell because she couldn't even stop. And sometimes she thought that people around her thought she was going to die. So she went back into the mouth of the cave. And suddenly she felt cold. The other two companions were jumping and hopping and skipping around. And very good felt this lovely woman. She looked up, and there was a light there. And there she was, the beautiful, holy, and immaculate mother of God. She had come, the Lord. Bernadette did not know she 
she was. She only knew that a very beautiful lady was standing there in front of her. And the lady looked down at her and smiled. And the lady had by her side the Holy Most Holy Virgin. So Bernadette, moved by some instinctive feeling, knelt down. And she looked up, spellbound, at this lovely lady and her smile. And this was the first of the appearances of our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, in glory to Bernadette Subiru. The two companions stopped their game and they came back and they saw that they had kneeling there. And she looked as though she was paralyzed. Her arms were out like this. And they saw something horrible that happened to her. They shook her. And finally she seemed to be aware that they were there. And she felt the pain. They had to help her back to her home. And she told them that she had seen a very beautiful man. And she said, now this is a secret. Please don't tell anyone. So of course they told her one. That's what all we have. So the work got around. The pair of death had seen a very beautiful lady at the front of the school. And uh, People began to be curious. Well, our first lady told her that they'd come back again. So she went back again. And she kept going. And there were a number of appearances there about that to me. And on one of these early appearances, Bernadette said to our lady, she said, Who are you? And the lady answered in French, in the dialect of that part of France. And she said, Je suis de la plaine I am the Immaculate Conception. Now the village of Lourdes had a very cold, very good parish priest. Very good. He loved his people and they loved him. And he was a true servant of God. So remember that went to him. Or he called for her, I think. I was wrong there. He called for her. He went to him. And she told him what she had seen. And she said, the priest said, what did, he, what did she say to you? And the veteran said, I am the Immaculate Conception. So the priest lost his patience. He said, she can't have said that. That's not good grammar. She might have said, I am Immaculately Conceived. But she could not have said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Better then looked at him with her clear, gray, honest eyes. And she said, Father, I can only tell you what she said to you. And she stuck to her soul. So this became known around the village that Bernadette had seen God's holy mother, Mary Immaculate. And it got beyond Lord. People in other parts of France learned about it. And there were many people who came there out of curiosity. Now the authorities there at the local village, as in all places in France at that time, were free of some appointments. That is, they were entering the church. So they then began pushing to meet Bernadette and her family. And Bernadette was having a very hard time. Police sent for her, she had to go to the police station, she had to be testified, they tried to break her down. They gave her sort of a third degree going over. But she stuck to her sword. She never buried her. What I am. So our present lady said that she wanted a shrine for her. And she told Bernadette of the need of penance and the need for people to obey her holy son, our blessed Lord. She talked at great length along these lines. So one day when Bernadette was there, she told her to scratch on the ground and that water would come out. So Bernadette scratched with her little fingers and a very muddy sort of bit of water did come out. But later it became a spring. And that spring had been flowing ever since. And people go, have gone there to bathe in that, put it on the cords and so on, bring away bottles of it, even bring buckets of it. Incidentally, I've read, and you probably read too, just like the spring's been drying up. I wonder if there's a message in that for us. That something is just pretty sharp idea. That's what every may be. However, let's go away. Lord became a household word. Not only in France, but in Italy and all over Europe and all over the world. And people began asking, is it really God's mother of a Well, the church took the matter under advice. And finally, the church decided that everything was genuine. 
that the appearances of our lady were absolutely different. And then something else strange began happening. Sick people started going. And many others were healed. And these were not just people with the eggs or with uh, uh, some minor disease. People went there with cats. Sometimes incurable cats. They went there with hideous bone uh, fractures and bone maladjustments. With all sorts of very, very serious things. Doctors have said there was no hope. They came on to So Lord became known all over the world. And he became one of the holy places of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. I've been visited Lord once. I spent about two weeks there. That was about seven years ago. I was there in the month of August and I was there over the priest of the Sun. A wonderful time to be in court. I sent mass every day in the Silicon Valley. Any priest who goes there is allowed to say mass. But I saw signs up there that only the notes or the was allowed. However, I don't say the notes or the because that's not the mass. I would not say the notes or the for any of them. Any more than I would say the Baptist communion service. In fact, I think the Baptist communion service and the notes or the are on parallel. So I went in and talked about that person who there, one's a priest. One presents one, what they call a little card of identity. And the sacristan gives you a chalice and a pack and a host, a big boat. Then there are about 30 altars in a row. You wait till there's a vacant one, if need be. The priest goes and he puts the chalice and pack down there. Vestments are already on the altar. He puts your vestments on. And uh, there's a, in French there, there's a notice of a book, which I put in the And uh, I have my book, St. Andrew's Epistle there, which has a whole match, the gospel of the Epistle of every meaning, in English and in Latin. I put that down, and I said this mass every day, the true mass, which is the only mass I said, the true mass of the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, I said it in the only language that one ever reads. And uh, I noticed sometimes clergy, no sort of clergy, along these other altars. One day I was saying past there that the altar was next to me. Three young French priests came in, and these I thought they were priests, they had on shorts and only neck hairs. And uh, no vestments. They started saying the uh, some sort of uh, service, I don't know what it was. And they each gave each other to drink out of the chalice and also the thing. Well, I noticed every day that I went there and said mass, the people were here laughing coming from my home. Lay people, they come in, and they kneel down to my home and hear mass to there. So they knew what was the mass. However, I spent two wonderful weeks here. And I felt very close to heaven. And very close to Beverly Hills. And very close to the Holy Mother of God the whole time I was there. I put on my costume when I arrived there and I wore that everywhere I was. In the streets, all the time. I only took that up when I went to see the And uh, people see me in the streets, like, I said, that was a priest. They said, well, this is a priest, we got our pastor. So people came up to me, Father, will you bless this medal? Father, will you bless this rosary? Father, will you bless this statue? Father, will you hear my confession? Sometimes they knock right down the sidewalk. Not me, no, but hear the confession, give them that speech. So it showed that people want priests. They don't want the men in shorts running around who are just a doctor. They want priests. And uh, I was there, as I told you, on the Feast of the Assumption. And on the Feast of the Assumption, I decided instead of saying the same Mass in the Basilica, I was going to say Mass in another place in the Lord, but this was to be great. The Subi Road family, that family I heard that one year, it was a very cold winter, the snow was deep on the ground. And during that winter, Baronet's father had hardly any jobs at all. The family had hardly any food. The children had to just ride the way. And to cap it all, they were thrown out of the little house and they were to the So the municipality of the town allowed them to use an old jail cell that stood in the middle of the town. It was just an isolated one cell jail. It was hardly ever used because the Lord was a small way. So the very next time, I lived there for one whole thing. And this jail cell was dead, cold, with water drinking out the walls. The rain was getting in. There were just tiny little windows 
the top, a couple of them. And that was an urgent surgery that was in her breast cancer. She coughed and coughed, she had no heart, and she had every disease in the cancer. The poor girl. And that's the day that made into a shadow. And it's called the Tasha. So, uh, I was staying in the hotel there, there were several French people there, who liked me with traditional Catholics. And they asked me, they said, Father, we're going to say Mass on here something. I said, I'm going to say anything about it. They said, maybe go. I said, yes, no, I said it. <laughs> so, uh, probably I was about eight or nine hours went up there on the morning of the assumption. And, uh, there was a sister in drive there, and those were both those sisters. They didn't even know they were And when I went in, and she saw my husband, she glared at me. And she said, are you ready to do that? I said, yes, I am. And uh, she said, that's not allowed. I said, can you tell me that's not allowed? So she quiet on that. So we all went in and I said, that's not that. Just that. And you know, during pauses in that mass, and I've been looking out in the congregation, because I had to say it to people in another way, and I was so okay with it. When I was looking out at the people, I said, that's what's your advice. This is an end that I saw a young girl right there. And she had on a very ragged dress. And she looked up at me with her clear, honest gray eyes. And I said to myself, those eyes have looked above the Holy Mother of God. Better than the same thought in that. She's a friend of the Queen of Heaven. Lord is the one that was like, very beautiful place. In the summer, the hills around there, the mountains are green, lovely. The clear river going to the mountains is very beautiful. It's a lovely place. And as I say, I felt very close to heaven. I'm going to do this like that today. So the Lord is very lovely. But in Portugal, when one leaves Lisbon, the capital, and goes north, the country is not lovely. It's harsh, brown, barren. And the further north one goes, the poorer the country becomes. On some of the hills, the only thing that grows is thorn roses. And as one goes along, I went to the bus, the second time I went there, I did not even twice. As one went along the road, one noticed that the women and girls along the road were most prepared. And they are so poor. And finally, one came to the poor little doubt of bus. Of course, it was very poor in 1970, and there was very little left. Today, there are many shops there. There's a magnificent big facility. There are grocery shops galore. Thousands and thousands of people come. On the 13th of May, one million people usually go there. And they march around at night with like a candle. So I went to Buffalo twice. I said, thanks. In 1917, the world was locked in a great world war. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of people were being killed on the battlefield of the earth. It was a terrible war. All, everything went. Poison gas was being used. It was a cruel war. It was a war in which destruction was happening. Especially the destruction of the so it was a great crisis in human affairs. And in 1917, on the 13th day of May, three little children of two poor families took a few bits of bread and a jug of water. And they went off the hills near Papua to watch. And finally they sat down in the midday sun the heat in my head and for the moment is pretty heavy. You get very high temperatures. And the heat was shivering. And you could see heat shimmering in the air. And these children all looked in the direction of the thorn bush. They saw the heat flickering like this in the air. And then suddenly this thorn bush seemed to be a flame with a brilliant light. And the children stared astonished. And 
and their eyes were fixed there, and there she was, a beautiful lady. This was the first of the various appearances of God. Another visitation of our Lady. The children, of course, did not know who she was. But they went back and they told their parents. And this was noise of God. Now these appearances kept up on the 13th of every month, from the 13th of May to the 13th of October. And Our Lady talked at great length with these children. And she told them many strange things. Some of the things we know, others we don't yet know. Perhaps we never shall. She told them terrible things. She told them about all the things that they come to the world. And she warned them that people must repent, they must turn to Christ. Otherwise the world would be doomed. And she saw that she gave them various visions. She let them look over into hell. And they saw the horrors of hell, these three children. And they were frightened and terrified. And she talked to them strangely about the Russian. Now these three children had no education. They didn't even know what Russia was. They didn't know whether Russia was a country or an animal or what. But she talked to them about Russia. And she talked about the conversion of Russia. And she talked about the horrible things that were going to happen in Russia. Now, mind you, there's one thing very interesting about this. The Russian Revolution, which brought communism into power in the world, happened not in the month of May, but in the month of October. So our lady was talking about Russia before the Russian Revolution had taken place. And she told them that he was praying for Russia, for its conversion. And the horrible things would come out of Russia. And who will doubt that horrible things have come out of Russia? Russia used to be a holy nation dedicated to Christ. Today it's a country of solid atheism, in which the church has only a perfect existence underground. It's a country in which horrible things happen, in which there's no liberty, no freedom, in which slavery has been reintroduced. It's a place where horrors exist. And our lady talked to these three innocent children about Russia. She told them certain things were going to happen. Now one thing that I'm certain she told them was that there was going to be a terrible crisis in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church. And who will not a horrible crisis has come to the Roman Catholic Church? A horrible crisis, begging from that disastrous and satanic house of Adam and Eve. So Fatima has become a work known throughout the world. I said nice in Fatima on my second visit there. On my first visit there, I was not a priest. And I said mass, not in the basilica, but in a little place out in the square in front, where, on the actual spot where our lady appeared. And the altar where I put the chalice and fatten down was the very spot where our lady stood, above the door. So I went, it was pouring with rain when I arrived in Fatima on that second visit. And I had a cold. And the journey up from Lisbon was five hours. And I had to leave before uh, dawn. This was in the month of January, a very cold time that I was there. And uh, the bus stopped all along the road to pick up people, and every time it stopped, both the front door and the back door opened automatically. And a wind, a sort of a cyclone, went through the bus. So when I got to Patin, I could hardly speak, I had such a heavy cold. So anyway, I said Mass. And the sacrist had brought to me a Tridentine Latin Missal. And he knelt down and served my Mass inside. And there were about 30, between 30 and 40 people there, mostly elderly women with black shawls over their heads. So when I finished the Mass, I knelt down in front of the altar, said the prayers for the conversion of Russia. And then I said the liturgy of Our Lady in Latin. And they all gave responses, order for notice, over the order for notice, and so on. And as I passed out, they all looked up at me and nodded with pleasure because they heard a Latin Mass and through Mass. And they were so glad that. So Fatima is a very wonderful place. And we have heard the last of Fatima. Fatima is one of the most significant words of our time. Fatima has a tremendous meaning which we don't even understand yet. A meaning for the future of the world. A meaning for the future of the church. 
Fatima is the word of destiny in the world today. Incidentally, I was talking about prayer for worship. You know the prayers that we say in English at the end of every Mass. Free Hail Mary, the Salve Regina, yeah. another prayer, another prayer of Michael, Sacred Heart of Jesus. Those prayers are for the conversion of Russia. As far as I know, we traditional Catholics are the only people who still pray for the conversion of Russia. And I always take great pleasure in saying those prayers at the end of Mass for Russia. That Russia will turn and renounce communism and Marxism and atheism and turn again to Christ in his own mind. So our lady, her first visitation was to her cousin who said a little. But she is always visiting here in the world, appearing in times of great crisis. She appears to those who are innocent and pure in heart, because those are the only people that she can talk to. And each time she brings a message, and the message concerns our devotion to her son, who is very God. And let me say just one thing for her. Devotion to man is a fundamental part of the Catholic religion. There is no such thing as Christianity without man. If you try to teach Mary out of it, it's no longer Christianity. Devotion to Mary and belief in her immaculate conception and her assumption and to her the fact that she is sweet with heaven, those are not just sort of fringe benefits of, it, of it, our faith. Those are fundamental. Mary the fact that stands in the very middle of our faith. It's true she said it's not just like ours. She never said it's not here. She's always behind her. In his time. For she's always in the center of him. And if you leave out Mary, you will never, never come in contact with Christ. I've said that to Protestants. I've said it to unbelievers. I've said it to those sort of people who throw our next present day out of the church. If you do not pray to Mary, if you do not keep her in the center of your faith, you are no longer Christian. There is no such thing as Christianity without men. So every year, in the month of May, and again in the month of October, we dedicate ourselves to the Holy Mother of God. And on coming July 2nd, the Feast of the Visitation, let us remember that one of the great visitors in this broken, sinful world of ours is Mary Immaculate. She is always coming here in times of great crisis. To tell us that Christ is our all in So let us reconsecrate ourselves to the immaculate heart of Mary.